Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, where either myself or my good friend and fellow artist and art teacher, Ashley Hurst, tries to create a drawing or some piece of art for you guys uh, inside of 45 minutes. Of course, we're going to sprinkle in some instruction as well. And tonight, I am super nervous about this one because... I'm going to try to do a line and wash image <laughs> that's pen and ink and watercolor in 45 minutes. And honestly, you know, usually I feel pretty confident about these things. Uh, tonight, I don't feel confident at all. I don't think I'm going to make it, but I'm going to try. And uh, Ashley is going to be, I, I guess, providing some support for me. How are you doing over there, Ashley? I'm not sure. You know, I think of watercolor <laughs> as sort of a slow medium. You know, you paint a little bit and then you kind of watch it dry. So... Matt's got his hair dryer out. We'll see how things go. Um, yeah, I do have a hair dryer. So hopefully this thing will be my secret weapon here. Um, no, it's going to be great. I'm just joking. I don't I don't mean to make it seem like it's an impossible <laughs> task. It's not. I know, I know the process Matt plans to use. And it's going to work out well. When you're combining two mediums, you know, um, each of them does a little bit of the work. So it's not depending on just the watercolor all the way through so it's going to go great and i hope you guys are going to participate out there too well i if it doesn't go great great i'm blaming <laughs> you people out there in youtube land <laughs> because so many of you have asked to see pen and ink and watercolor um here as part of getting sketchy it's true and uh so i'm gonna try it and we'll see what happens you know i think most of you have requested either watercolor or pen and ink not a combination of the two, but um, I really feel like there's not enough time to do a pen and ink drawing. There's really not enough time to do a watercolor drawing, mm -hmm. but if I can combine both of them together, maybe it'll work out. Anyway, uh, getting sketchy as the name implies is we're gonna be creating a sketchier, looser image here. So it's not gonna be a refined, finished image. We reserve those kind of things for our courses and our live lessons, uh, which are part of uh, our program over at thevirtualinstructor.com. Uh, there, we have lots of different courses on a variety of different subjects, drawing, painting, graphite, colored pencils, pastels, acrylics, uh, watercolor, mixed media. There's so much to explore over there. And there are weekly live lessons that we do. Uh, right now we're in the middle of a live lesson series where we're doing a colored pencil drawing of a peony flower. And we're gonna be finishing that one up uh, over the next two weeks. Um, and those those lessons are, of course, slower so that you see the entire process from start to finish instead of the looser, sketchy, or sketchier uh, drawings and paintings that we create here on um, Getting Sketchy Live. Uh, so anyway, if you want to check out our program, there's a link below this video. You can check it out. Everyone starts out with a free trial for a week. Um, so you can see if it's right for you, of course. And uh, if you want to check out three of our course videos and ebooks for free, there's a link in the description below as well. And also, if you're new to this channel or you're just finding it or you haven't done so yet, go ahead and subscribe and click on the notification bell so you're notified when we do go live here on Getting Sketchy and when we do uh, post new videos, of course. So, um, did I leave anything out? Or? I don't think so. I wanted to um, just say that you're getting some support in the chat right now. Oh, good. Oh. So, uh, Lil, <laughs> Lil Gardner says, you've got this one, Matt, and I think he's right. Rocky Max says, very sketchy tonight. We'll see, Rocky. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sketchy all the time. <laughs> I'm less sketchy when I'm actually on a live broadcast, believe it or not. So, uh, I, I, I can't speak for Ashley. He's... You mean how, whether or not you're how less sketchy? sketchy? No, no, how sketchy you are in reality. I'm 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 equally sketchy all the time. I'm a Libra, so I'm equally sketchy all the time, all the way around. <laughs> Is that true of Libras? What I don't, I'm making that up. I don't really read horoscopes. I know that there. Yeah, I, I don't either. A little horoscope symbol is a scale, uh -huh. so it's balanced. So I guess that means that I'm equal on both sides. I'm relatively symmetric. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm an Aquarius. Uh, I don't think that matters uh, at all. But uh, anyway, uh, so we're going to talk for a couple of minutes about the materials and then we'll get into this one. But I should point out, if you are watching this on YouTube live, uh, there is a chat box. You can, of course, post comments and questions during tonight's broadcast. And sometimes the chat box gets rolling pretty quickly and uh, it'll help us see it or actually help Ashley see it because he's man in the chat box tonight. If you put your comments or questions directed at us in all capital letters, 
Um, and you can ask any question that you want, as long as it's art related, you know, it doesn't have to be about what we're talking about tonight. I guess you could ask any question that you want, but uh, we're probably only gonna answer the ones that are art related. Uh, don't you think? Probably, yeah, probably. unless it's really compelling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let's go ahead and switch over here and uh, see what happens. All right, here's a look at uh, the ladybug that uh, we're going to be attempting tonight. Now, um, this subject could be considered simple, and it could be considered complex depending on how much you want to see over there because there's a lot of details that we can pull out and there's a lot of details that we can omit so um we'll 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 see what happens as i mentioned before now this image is from pixabay but i have uh edited it quite a bit actually um mm -hmm. i zoomed in really close cropped it down i also enhanced the colors believe it or not this ladybug was even more yellowy orange than that? what it is. I actually brought up some of the reds uh, in Photoshop and uh, it tried to enhance some of the blacks a little bit. So we're mm -hmm. not gonna be drawing the ladybug on the blade of grass. We're actually just gonna have uh, the ladybug, him or her. Uh, you know, they're not all ladies, are they? I don't believe so. They can't so. all be ladies. It's impossible. Oh, there wouldn't be any ladybugs. <laughs> I know how I know how biology works. Okay, well, yeah. Well, um, anyway, um, we are going to put this uh, ladybug just on a, a flat white surface conveniently. Mm -hmm. Now, the paper I'm going to be using for this is Canson Heritage Hot Press watercolor paper. This is my favorite hot press watercolor paper. This is 140 pounds. How hot press water, watercolor paper differs from cold press watercolor paper is that uh, the hot press paper is smoother. So it kind of works a little bit better for pen and ink with watercolor, but uh, of course you can use cold press watercolor paper as well. If you don't have uh, the materials that I'm using tonight, of course, somebody mentioned they were using graphite, you can use whatever you want. You know, the whole purpose is to practice observing and making marks based on what you see. And that's what we're going to be doing here. Now, I'm going to be using a Stiedler lead holder to sketch things out initially. I do believe there's 2H graphite in here. I didn't check, but uh, with the hot press watercolor paper, the marks are usually a little bit lighter anyway. So uh, you could use an HB pencil, which is a regular number two pencil. Or if you have an H pencil, you can use that too. You probably, if you're going to be using watercolor, you probably want to stay away from uh, the 2Bs or the 4Bs or, or things that are, are graphite that's softer which is easily smeared and is gonna be really visible through your drawing. After we get the graphite sketch in place, I'm gonna move over to the Steeler pigment liners here. And I'm gonna be using probably two pins, a 0.1 and a 0.3 um, pin here. I love these Steeler um, pins. They're very similar to the Micron pins, except the tips are a little bit stronger and they tend to last a little bit longer. They are pricier uh, compared to the, steel, or to the uh, pigment the pig, the micron pins, mm -hmm. the, uh, what are they? they're made by a secure, aren't they? The Pigma micron pins. Pigma, that's what it is. Um, anyway. I couldn't remember myself. <laughs> the Pigma micron pins are a little bit cheaper, of course, but they tend to run out a little bit quicker, but it's basically the same kind of pen. This is just maybe a little bit higher quality. I'm going to be using my Winsor & Newton travel set here. Uh, these are the professional level watercolors, not the Cotman watercolors. Yeah, so I've got a very limited palette here. I'll probably be using uh, cadmium red, uh, ultramarine, uh, burnt umber, yellow ochre maybe, and cadmium yellow medium, and maybe a little bit of burnt sienna. So uh, those are the colors that I'll probably be grabbing from here. Mm -hmm. This will probably be off camera tonight um, so we can see the photo reference, of course. But um, And I'll be using several different brushes. These are Grumbacher Golden Edge brushes. Uh, these are fantastic brushes for watercolor. Not everybody's gonna like these brushes. They're a little bit stiffer than maybe some of the softer haired brushes, but I kinda like a stiffer brush. Uh, it gets, feels like it gives me a little bit more control. So, all right, uh, I think we're ready to go. Let me get this watercolor out of the way. All right, and Brent Does Art mentions that he bought those pens on your uh, recommendation and they're his favorite pens now. Awesome. Yeah, so they're my favorite yeah. uh, disposable pens for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do here with the ladybug is I'm going to break the ladybug's body down into basic shapes. I'm going to start by looking at basically the angle at which the, 
the bug is positioned in. And uh, then I'm going to start with, uh, I guess it's the abdomen. Mm, here we here are we, again. Here we go again. And I just and bragged about how much Maybe the thorax <laughs> and then the head. That's right. Is that right? I believe so. Okay. I believe so. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and put the timer up there, and I'll go ahead and get started here. Now, I'm going to be working as fast as I possibly can here because um, I really don't feel like I have enough time here. So um, I will try to do as much instruction as I possibly can here, but just keep in mind that I'm going to be working as fast as I can. So you're finding the gesture right now, the right angle now, of the Right now I'm body. finding the angle, and I'm kind of thinking about this in my mind as I'm moving the, the pencil over the paper. And I'm going to look at where I want the abdomen to end and maybe where the head to begin, and then I'm going to start from there. Okay, we do have a comment, a question from um, Otto Didact, I believe, Otto Didact. Do you stretch the paper beforehand? That's a great question, and pr I don't think Matt stretched this paper. This is yeah. a really small drawing. It's 140-pound paper. The the larger the uh, painting, actually, the paint, the larger the painting gets to be, um, the more beneficial it is to stretch your watercolor paper to avoid buckling. For those of you who are wondering why would you stretch paper and how do you stretch paper, um, you stretch watercolor paper by soaking it in some water, not too long, because you don't want the glue called size in the paper to, to come out, you know, to dissolve and come out into the water. So you just soak it very briefly and, uh, and blot it a tad and then, and then tape it down with tape that's brown, it's like brown paper tape that has an adhesive that activates when it gets wet. And it's kind of a lot like an envelope. If you, know. you don't have that tape, you can also use masking tape. Sure, or, you can. Or staples. I've even stretched watercolor paper with staples. I, I saw somebody do it on, a, on, a, on stretcher bars with brass tacks one time, if you can believe that. Yeah, just like I a canvas. It. Yeah, just like a canvas. But this one's so small, and the paper being 140-pound paper, and being that it's mixed media, Matt's not going to work this paper for several days with water. Um, and watercolor, he's just going to do a, some a few washes over it. So uh, this 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 is uh, artwork. Really, it's not necessary to stretch the paper. But great question, and sometimes that's a, a a great benefit. Yeah, and that's a great answer too, because we don't really. I, I the last time I stretched paper was oh maybe a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time I did a larger watercolor painting. Um, so most of the paintings I do with watercolor are small. So I do have the paper taped down though. Um, you can't see sides. that. Yes. Um, that is important. Uh, and if you don't want to go through that step of taping the watercolor paper down, there are watercolor blocks that you can purchase, mm -hmm. um, that have a little bit of adhesive on the end and kind of hold things in place. They're great for, for carrying with you you know, for traveling, using a watercolor block. Russ S. just mentioned that. What about using watercolor blocks? Yeah. Okay, so I'm basically just breaking things down into the larger shapes and then the smaller shapes that I see within the larger shape. So I'm not really, you know, it may look like I was concerned with the contour lines, but I was really thinking more about the broader shape. And mm -hmm. now that I've got these broader shapes in place, now it's pretty easy to find these smaller shapes inside of it. Too many people, I think, start with those contour lines, and then when they get back around to where they started, everything's all messed up <laughs> mm -hmm. because they didn't think about the shape to begin with. We should draw with shapes and refine with line. Well, you're getting these shapes in pretty fast. I, I, gotta I say. have to. I have no choice. Yeah. I have to fly. Uh, no pun intended here. Mm -hmm. So ladybugs come in all colors. I didn't know that. This one you said was sort of yellowish or yellow. It was kind of more yellow originally. orange. Yeah. Um, orange. I'm working on the way I say or orange. It's a work in so progress. <laughs> uh, you know, I had uh, my cousin's husband told me that I say orange like a pirate. <laughs> so I'm working on that. He said it's not orange. Not a pirate. You know, when I think things like that about people, I just keep it to myself. 
but some some people. Well, you know, <laughs> I had a shocking experience the other the other day. You know, talking about keeping things to yourself. You can see I drew the leg here, uh, the first leg, uh, just with the segments. Again, just breaking things down in the shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, we were leaving an ice cream place the other night, um, and somebody was coming out with a magnolia flower. And, you know, we all know what a magnolia flower it looks mm -hmm. like uh, around here. This is, we're obviously in the southern part of the United States, and magnolias are everywhere. You know, everybody's seen the magnolia uh, flower. Well, these people apparently had not, and they were coming out of the ice cream place, and somebody made a comment about the flower, and, or my wife said, oh, what a beautiful magnolia flower. And they were like, oh, is that what that is? We were trying to figure out what it was. My my grandmother picked it from the corner of her yard, and um, I said, "I said, oh, I guess, I guess you guys aren't from around here." And, and one of the kids, with you know, this is like a teenager, said, "You know, there are some things we just don't say out loud." <laughs> And that kind of took me off guard because I didn't mean any malice. You didn't actually say anything that was insulting, though, no, or make no, a no, suggestion. No. I was like not, they were un, you know, uninformed for like a, a reason other than legitimate. Absolutely not. I was just, you know, I was just making a comment that you know, <laughs> who doesn't know what a magnolia? You should have responded. Like. And children are to be seen and not heard. <laughs> yeah. No, I, well, I don't see, I don't I'm think about kidding. those things. I'm always uh, sharp tongued, I, not in the moment. So. Right. I always, you know, I always think about those things later. All right, let's let's draw some spots on this guy here. Um, or this girl. On this lady. Now let's see, we have had a couple questions. Okay. Um <laughs> Matt, is there a place for H through H or six H pencils in this kind of artwork? I often use them for a character, uh, for characters, and this is from Ash, Ash Aurora. Uh I guess so. I never use those pencils. I'm a, I use a 2H regularly. That's sort of my go-to yeah, for, for light pencil drawing. Yeah. I like to skip every other pencil. So when I think about pencil weights, um, I think of uh, I choose a 2H, an HB, a 2B, or a 4B. And that's pretty mm -hmm. much my range. Yep. I can't really tell the difference between two pencils that are right next to each other. So I just choose to go with sort of the even numbers because that captures the HB right in the middle. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. I concur. Um, I would say a two H is as hard as I'll ever go with a pencil. Mm -hmm. um, and then I usually only go as soft as a four B. If I go uh, lighter than a two H, I find that myself, I start really bearing down because I can't hardly see. And then I end up with depressions in the paper. So for me, a, a four H would be a little dangerous. Dangerous. Yeah. But, you know, they started a club a few years ago. I think that got pretty popular. That 4-H pencil? Mm -hmm. It's pretty dangerous, that club. No, the 4-H. <laughs> is that still around, the 4-H club? I don't know. I used to see commercials it for it when I was growing up. probably isn't. Yeah. It's probably died off like everything else that's good in probably. the world. <laughs> 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 um, all right. Mm. So, okay, I got another question from Cynthia. Cynthia asks, how do you decide to simplify a photo? What do you leave out or change? Um, well, that is, that's such a great question and it's, it's such a big question. You almost too. need to see what you started with. Yeah. Cause to it's going to be I different think. for every subject, but mm -hmm. there, I, I think what I want to say about this is there are a lot of times of we come, you come across a photo or, um, or some type of reference and inside of it, it you know, the subject works for the photo, but if you tried to create a drawing or painting of what you're seeing in the photo, it would not translate properly. And I think that's the bigger thing to look out for in a, a reference. You know, maybe we should collect a f like three or four images, photographs that have that would have problems if you were to, to reproduce them just the way they look in a mm -hmm. drawing. That might be a good lesson. Uh, well, I, one example I can think of off the top of my head, and this isn't a specific example, but, you know, there's a lot of photography that looks uh, really cool because it's almost abstract a little bit. Like you might see a field with a pattern. Like yeah. a, those probably aren't going to work really well for, mm -hmm. they're going to work great for a photograph, but they're probably not going to work really well for a painting. All right. Um, and also, you want to think about the, the most important things to include in a, in a reference are the value range um, mm -hmm. and um, 
little minute details are things that you can leave out. So it's hard to say. It all That's a good on answer. Yeah. Focus on form and value and less maybe on texture. That's a great way to think about simplifying at least at first. Okay. Now I'm going to start with the ink applications. I'm going to start with a 0.1 pen here. Beth Waller tells us that the 4-H club is quite active in rural areas. Thank goodness for that. Nice. Yep. We used to have a wonderful, um, what was it, the FCA FCA club at, at a high school that I worked at. And, and the reason we thought maybe 4-H wasn't active anymore is because some of those FCA chapters are not. Do you mean FFA? FFA. Yeah. That's it. I'm, Future that's Farmers it. of America. That's right. Yeah. FFA. Well, the FFA is pretty that, active at my daughter's I hope high so. school. Yeah, I hope so. I was I hated to see that program they sort of dissolve at but my now, school. And maybe it'll come back. I think it really depends on the sponsor. But now this. the school you're at is an inner city school. Right. It's urban. And that's yes. It, these are the kids that need FFA in their life. They need to know where you know how to how to grow stuff. And right. Where, and where grown things come from. But out here, um, I live in a, a rural area that's very close to an urban area. <laughs> and um, out here, they do all kinds of stuff. They have tractor races, <laughs> um, all kinds of crazy stuff, <laughs> uh, which, you know, I'm sure it might be exciting. I don't know. I've never seen a tractor race, but can't imagine I've seen, it can't I have seen um I've seen lawnmowers race. I know how you do that. It's kind of the same thing, yeah. I think. I think you take the gears, the two gears that are in there, and swap them. That's what I've been told. Okay, so with the ink here, what I'm initially doing is I'm just trying to get some of the contours down. And I am kind of putting a few indications of some lines where I see some changes in value. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. And I am putting some textural information here. There's some little dark spots and things like that. And then I'm going to go back with a thicker pen, and I'm going to enhance the line quality. Now, line quality is the thickness or thinness of a line. And by adjusting the line quality, we add variety to the image and also a little bit of an illusion of form. Matt, I've got to read a comment to you. Okay. This goes back to your orange or our orange. Ar yeah, yes. So, um, William writes, I grew up saying orange. And uh, when, I was a, when I was little, I thought that the black stuff on the road, the round thingy on your car, and the tall thingy at the radio station were all the same word, tar. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, William. Yep. I might have grown up in a similar... Yeah. We may have grown up in the same town. I don't know. Now, what, <laughs> what is the thing at the radio station? The tar? Okay, now that one, that one I'm having trouble with. I'm, yeah. I'm aware of the, of the tar on my car and the tar on the road. Yeah. I'm not sure about the tar at the radio oh, station. Oh, the tower. The tar. <laughs> it's the tower. <laughs> oh, that is so great. That is so great. And that's how you simplify language. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you just climb up that tar right over there. Okay, with my lines here, I'm putting some broken lines here and there. It doesn't, we don't have to have a complete line everywhere. And you can also change your graphite drawing. And you go back in with the ink as well. So anything you want to exaggerate or anything you want to change, you can definitely do that. All right, let's see. Now, you, are you did you say you're using the point one? I'm using the point one right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is not the smallest, right? That is the smallest one I'm going to use for this okay. drawing. Okay. But it's definitely not the smallest pen okay. that Steedler makes. Just checking. Yeah. All right, let's go back up here and get some of these spots outlined. And let's see how we're doing on the time. 30 minutes. That's not bad. I guess. I have no idea. <laughs> you don't have a certain amount of time you're saving for the watercolor? No, I'm just going as fast as I possibly can. Because okay. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to make it. I don't think there's any way I'm going to make it. But I'm going to try. And remember, 
This is all about the exercise, all about having some fun anyway. You know, so I think it was earlier in the chat, and I'm sorry if I've missed some of your comments. The chat, sometimes it's it freezes and sometimes it really rolls. Right now it happens to be frozen. But uh, I think it was Brent Does Art that mentioned the skull on the front of the little ladybug. Mm-hmm. And I was going to mention that earlier, but I didn't want to because it, uh, ladybug is such a friendly, a friendly little little creature. I didn't want to mention that there's what appears to be a death's head right on the front of it. But but um, Brent mentioned it first, so I'll go ahead and uh, and sort of back that up. It is pretty interesting. Yeah, it's it like, is. It's like an it inverted cool. skull. Yeah, but you so. know what? I think skulls are cool and beautiful. I and, true. Um, I know everybody is not going to share that <laughs> sentiment, but I think they're pretty awesome. And when I um, was in middle school and high school, I used to just draw skulls all the time. That was one of my favorite things to draw. In fact, that Guns N' Roses album cover. Oh, yeah. Um, what was it? Appetite for Destruction. Skulls with long hair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that was my favorite album cover because mm-hmm. it just had skulls and a cross on it. It was so yeah, cool. It was super cool. But um, anyway, my mom thought that I worshipped Satan <laughs> for a period of time <laughs> uh, because I drew skulls all the time and thought they were so awesome. But they're and they're you had just to remind awesome. Her that she has her very own skull. She takes it everywhere she goes. Who's that? Your mom. She does. Yep. And she's got one. Yep. It's on top of her neck. It's right at, right there at the top. Everybody's yep. got one. Brent Desart mentions that ladybugs bite. Yeah, they do. They bite bugs. I guess they bite people too, but they eat a lot of bugs. They're great to have in your garden. Really? I've never true? been eaten by a uh, bitten eaten by a ladybug. I've never been bitten by a ladybug that I'm aware of. But I do spend a lot of time outside. I do collect a lot of bug bites somehow down in, out out in the garden. Was that what you down in the woods? So maybe some of them are ladybug bites. Um, now I, I don't know how many people have heard this before, but uh, when I was in college, you know what I'm going to say, right? Maybe you don't. I'm not sure. Um, I worked. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I worked for I know uh, where this is going. An environmental health in the mosquito control division. <laughs> I was a mosquito control technician. And uh, we actually went out in the field and captured mosquitoes. And how do you think we did it? We let them land on us and bite us. Um, but I later learned that being a mosquito control person is one of the most dangerous jobs in the United States. Imagine that. (laughs) Apparently you can get malaria from it. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yeah. You know, all the diseases that, uh, around here, any, any mosquito in any area can give you malaria. Well, not here, but if it's possible. Okay. But there are other diseases that mosquitoes carry. You know? they're, they're little uh, little vampires is what they are. You were letting little nature's vampire. Well, what the strangest yeah. thing is there for a while after I worked that job, I never had any reactions to any mosquito bites. It was almost hmm. like they either didn't bite me or I had no reaction. I would say I had probably no reaction. It's like you vaccinated yourself it kind with of enough is, mosquito but, yeah, bites. Yeah, it kind of was. But, you know, I, I get those bites now, but... Less so than I think I did before. Um, that brings me to a thought. I don't, and I don't have an answer. Do do beekeepers have less of a reaction to bee stings over time if they get stung? I don't know. Of course, maybe if they're good beekeepers, they don't get stung. I don't know. No offense to beekeepers out there. I just wonder about that. All right, there's a little spot we've got. Okay, to- now let's see. Uh, we had a question. And it has rolled. Let me see if I can find it again. This is from Sherry Scott. Hi, guys. What are your thoughts on uh, Grizzazale? Um, that is basically indirect painting. Yeah. Actually, that's how I paint. I'm, that's why I wanted to read your question. I use a gray underpainting that is just totally, completely finished, details and all. And then when it's, when it's all dry, I do a painting on top of it in color. It does take twice as long, but it looks a lot better. We there are several lessons over on the website that uh, cover this that process mm-hmm. uh, in detail. Uh, some are part of the courses, so um, it is a process that I enjoy as well. But it is super time consuming. Yeah, so. it is. It is, but I love it. 
it just it it uh, allows me and anyone using it to separate hue from value and concentrate on all the values alone know that they look good that the contrast is where i want it and then change gears and start thinking about color and let my painting um, keep me on track in terms of the values you know if i put color down that doesn't match the value of that underpainting, that gray underpainting. I know it's wrong and I make an adjustment. I don't have to wonder. I've already, you know, done a value analysis through that underpainting step. So I think it's a great way to paint. Um, maybe it's the way to paint, but uh, those French Impressionists messed all that up, what with their painting on white canvases and such. All right, uh, real quick here, I've switched over to the 0.3 pin here, and I'm just going to enhance the line quality and start creating some hatching in some of these areas. So, like I said, line quality is the thickness or thinness of a line, and by varying the line quality, we can create the illusion of form and also add a bit more variety to the drawing. So you can see I've thickened up the bottom of the line here on the bottom side of the, I don't think this is a shell, um, but the wing, the wing covering mm -hmm. of the, the uh, ladybug yeah, here. Yeah, that's right. And, it's kind of like a it's like a door that opens up almost, you know, yeah, like a the, car door. It's, the, it's strange. Like the space shuttle hatch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to vary the line quality a little bit to give it a little bit more of a feeling of being three dimensional, and I'm also going to use this pen to, of course, uh, fill in some of the darker values and things here too. And let's. Did, did you mention see. Zika? Did you mention Zika? Zika, I that's totally one of the diseases. About Zika. Yeah. Yes, we got malaria, uh, dang, what is it, dengue fever? I don't know if I said that right. West Nile virus and Zika so far. Right. It, I mean, it's it's dangerous. You're like, what? What could you get? <laughs> a red, a red itchy bump. Uh, now I'm trying to to draw these hatch marks so that they flow. Along yeah. the form of the uh, bug here. Yeah, Susan has is thinking what I was thinking that the uh, that the what appears to be a shell opens up like Lamborghini doors, you know, like scissor doors. Is that what they call them? Kind of like that. Yeah. So the beetle is not really, um, you know, I drew a beetle, a, a regular beetle, last getting sketchy, but this one is a sports beetle because of the way its doors open up. The ladybug? Different than the Volkswagen Beetle that I drew last time. I'm just, we're just making analogies over here between your Beetle and sports cars. You're making those analogies. <laughs> it's Susan and I. Oh, you and Susan. <laughs> you and Susan are having a, quite a discussion yeah. over there, huh? Okay, so, you know, we got to keep in mind that I'm planning on keeping, or I got to keep in mind, I'm planning on keep you, adding yeah. some watercolor you've here. So. The, I was going to point out you've hit the... The, the uh, I guess, the midpoint, the midpoint of the sketch about 20 seconds ago. Oh, as far as time goes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so what I was going to say is I have to be mindful not only of the time, but also of the amount of ink that I put on the surface because the watercolor will adjust the value. It will change the value to a certain degree. So I'm not going to make this dark area quite as dark um, because of that. So it's going to be pretty dark, but not going to save a little bit for the watercolor. Save a little range. Although now I'm thinking I could have done this drawing with just pen and ink and it would have been. Change of plans, folks. No, no, water no, no change of plan. No change of plan. <laughs> I'm sticking with the plan. All right, so these spots have a little bit of variation in them. Yeah, and so now you're working on the spot um, that looks like a heart. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. This is such a lovely lady. There's a lot bug. going on in there. There is. There's quite a bit of variety in the value. Now, has anybody ever seen a blue ladybug? I know that they, they exist. I've never seen a blue ladybug. I'm not sure where. I've never seen a blue ladybug. And they exist in reality? Yeah. Okay. They, uh, ladybugs can come in all colors. 
I'd love to see a blue ladybug. I sure would. They must be really rare, you know, because you'd think you'd have seen a photograph of them by now. Yeah, I would you know, think so. In our lives, <laughs> as old as we are. I thought I would have run across one by now. Um, I'm just going to trust you. I have seen they are ladybugs real. with no spots. I could say that. I have seen those, mm -hmm. that's for sure. But as far as blue ladybugs, I'm not so sure I've seen that. Or I'm not, I don't know about that. Well, Gabriella I'll trust you. tells us that there are vampire ladybugs in Brazil, which is where there's lots of really crazy things, she says. Vampire? Yeah, vampire ladybugs. I'm going to look one up now. Hmm. I wonder if they have a... And Susan says she never has never seen a blue one while sober. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I wonder if they have a ladybug control technician position in Brazil for the vampire ladybugs. You know, like for the mosquitoes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's put a few little... Hatches there in the antenna. And almost ready for the watercolor here. And we will see what happens when that happens. I'm going to make some of the lines on the opposite side of the light source a little bit thicker here. And then, of course... All right, I'm looking at it, the steel blue ladybug from Australia. Are you really? Mm -hmm. Wow. That is one beautiful little dot. Well, it's in that Australia. They have all kinds of crazy stuff in Australia. I think, the, I think the top five poisonous snakes in the world are in Australia, something like that. Yeah, and spiders. They've mm -hmm. got spiders and... Great white sharks. Yeah, that is wow. That is something else. It almost looks like it's blue chrome. Okay, the shadow underneath this bug is not really totally obvious, but I'm going to try to kind of create one just so it looks like it's not necessarily floating here. Maybe a little bit under there. And the reason why I'm doing this now is because I'm going to outline it just very lightly. And it's like a little broken line you're putting around there. Yeah, just to give myself an idea, yeah. give me an idea of where that shadow might be. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to erase. So uh, we're going to erase the pencil lines. Are you using a kneaded eraser? I'm using a kneaded eraser here. I'm just going to be real light around that because that's a highlight that I kind of want to preserve. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that I'm not going to smear any of the ink here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm glad you're using a kneaded eraser. They're a little softer. So if this was just a pen and ink drawing and I wasn't planning on finishing this with watercolor, obviously I would add more ink Mm -hmm. to the drawing. But since we're going to add some color here. So it looks like you plan to do just some, a little tiny bit of shading with the color as well. A little bit. Mm. Well, it depends on how much time we got. Yeah. Let's see how much time we got. 16 minutes. Okay. <laughs> oh, maybe let's see what happens. All right. I think I went a couple minutes over last week. I'm going to start <laughs> uh, with a little bit of cadmium red and... A little bit of cadmium red and um, a little bit of cadmium yellow here too. So you can kind of see what I'm doing here. Now that's a neat set that Matt has. It's got a fold-out palette, and it's got another palette that is also a water bottle. Yeah. So it's right like the Swiss Army knife so, of, uh, of uh, watercolor sets. When I use this set, what I like to do is I like to have kind of warmer colors over here and cooler colors okay. or vice versa. So okay. I try to... Now, they're all going to blend and mix together at some point, but let's take a little bit of alizarin crimson just over here. There we go. All right. 
Yeah, that alizarin's so dark you can almost use it as the shadows and the you know mix into the shadows itself in the. All right, let's just start with a quick beetle. application here and pull pull some water on it and just try to keep this wet and fluid here. I put that right in a spot where we needed to have white. So we'll just lift that up. All right. Um, Pat tells us that your ladybug mat is a seven spotted ladybug, and they usually are orange or red, and they live a couple or three years, which is longer than I thought. I thought they only lived about a year, and they can eat up to 5,000 insects during their lifetime. Wow, I love ladybugs. What? Facts? I also love spiders for almost the same reason. It's because they eat all the bugs and bats. I don't love spiders. I watched the bats in my backyard clean up last night for about 20 minutes, and I know that they were eating the mosquitoes, and I'm really thankful for that. Spiders, um, they creep people out. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. mind them, but they do bite. Yeah, I don't. I'm not a big fan of spiders. I, I'm not really sure. I had a huge spider living next to my. It's not my front door. It's the side door. The one we come in and I'm at our house. Huge spider, and he would um he would tuck himself into the mortar of of the bricks during the day, and then every night or evening he would he would build a brand new web and catch bugs all night long. And we left him alone, and he probably lived by our door for a couple of months. Now you're saying he, but you're right. I, I, I have, uh, I've made an assumption about this spider's gender. So you can see I'm pulling a little bit of that cad yellow into this, and trying to allow it to mix while it's still wet, while still trying to keep up the intensity of the color. I'm putting these colors on a little bit more intense than I normally would, just because of the time. So normally I'd put a little bit of the color down, let it dry. And then layer over the top of it, but you, but you don't have time for all that. I don't it's, have time for that. It's active watercolor today. I ain't got time for Paying that. And wet in the wet, it may be some 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 spot blotting going on, who knows. It's got a sort of responsive. Yeah, we're going to let let watercolor be watercolor. more pops of that yellow here and there and looks like we've got a lot of uh, a lot of friends of spotters in the chat tonight people of course. that people like myself that don't kill spotters but would prefer them stay outside and i can agree with that i'd like to like them stay outside too now i have killed my fair share of black widows have we yeah. talked about this on here yeah. before? I, and i do that i don't and i don't mess around with black widows no and i like to take their bodies and line them up so the other black widows see them you gotta send a message and they go back and tell their other Black Widow friends, hey, we better not mess around with Matt. Cause you put them on tiny little toothpick spikes and line them up in your No, but yard. that's a great idea. I'll do yeah, it the next time. Yeah, put them on toothpicks <laughs> like uh, Alexander the Great did his enemies. Um, in our last house, I had killed Black Widow spiders all the time. Oh, the oh I, I don't, I know, you know, I'm, I'm a friend to the spider, but if I killed black widows all the time, I would really worry about that. I think I would be worried about. Some there was one time we went, yeah, we, my wife left something out on the back porch um, and brought it back in a few days later. And, you know, we had black widow spiders everywhere. And um, we went to the beach. We're gone for about a week. And came back, I came back first um, for everybody else. And there were Black Widow webs in the corners of our house. I inside. killed inside. I killed oh about 20 God. Black Widows in our That's house. That's crazy. I don't think you told me that. Yes. Or if you did, it was, I blocked it out. Oh, it was so, <laughs> it was so scary. Um, I was, I still have bad visions about that that uh the your combination of red the, the um cadmium red and alizarin crimson is really working well there 
Yeah, thanks. Mm. And I, I, I really like the transition in that uh, shell, if it's a shell. Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Lamborghini door. Now, um, Cynthia asks, have you ever used watercolor to enhance a graphite drawing? Um, no. I don't think I have on purpose. I have had the graphite left in my watercolors before, you know, um, and it's been a visible part of the artwork, but I don't think I've ever worked on a graphite drawing that included some shading like Matt's done with a pen and then also worked on it with a watercolor. Now, there are graphite pencils, you know, um, it's like a gra water-soluble graphite. Um, I wonder if you could work with that a little bit, you know, do some very minimal shading with that. And, of course, the even your lines would be soluble if you worked with a graphite pencil and then go into it with some color and let the graphite mute that color as they combine. Yeah, and there is graphitent pencils mm -hmm. by Derwent, I think, that is water-soluble graphite, but it's colored. Uh, so that's interesting. I mean, it might be interesting to you. <laughs> Susan refers to you as Matt the Impaler. Yes, but I don't like impale glad, them. Like I, glad. I mash them and then take their <laughs> bodies awful. and try to preserve their bodies as best as possible so that they can recognize each other. Do you think Pete is going to come after me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Um, we're talking about, these are black widow spiders, people. I saw a video at some point of a guy walking around mashing them and exploding them. So it can't be that bad. All right. Huh. I'm going to mute the, uh, audio for just a second. Okay. Then we're back. All right. All right. Definitely not ideal here, but uh, <laughs> got to do what you got to do here. Okay. Well, next, I'm going to take a little bit of ultramarine. No, Orion Nebula mentions that the black that you had put down looks so much lighter now. Now that you've got the color. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of contrast and yeah, value. That is right. Um, a little bit of burnt umber. Sherry yeah, asks. A little bit of alizarin have, crimson. Sherry McGee asks, have you ever used watercolor pencils yeah we've used watercolor pencils before so i've made kind of a purple here you see that mm -hmm. that's what i'm using here i like watercolor pencils i especially like them for sketching to work you know just to do some color and like sort of like color analysis in my sketchbook um i don't usually use watercolor pencils for um, for finished artwork not that you can't i just in my own personal process i just think they're ideal or carrying with you to work in your sketchbook, sort of, uh, you know, on site, on location. Yeah, not too long ago, we actually did a live lesson series with watercolor pencils, mm -hmm. the green bird. All right, so I'm using a purple here for the darker areas instead of a black, just to give it a little bit of color. And. If you wanted to use a black, of course you could, uh, but I would suggest mixing a black if that's the case. And uh, you mix a black by combining the blue, a dark blue and um, a dark brown. All right. Um, Mary Zanell asks, I'm not a fan of modern or abstract art, but curious if either of you do abstract painting. Um, and uh, I, that's a good question. I teach abstract painting and non-objective painting, and so I do abstract and non-objective artwork with my students, but my own artwork is not abstract in nature, and um, I, I, don't, I, I don't have a great appreciation myself for non-objective artwork um, just because I like, I like more uh, legible meaning in artwork. That's just me, um, but I can appreciate how the elements 
and principles of art work together to create a, you know, a, a balanced composition. So I, I do like, I think I like teaching, I like teaching non-objective art and, and abstract art because it gives me a way to engage my students with the elements and principles of art aside from drawing problems, you know, because a lot of times they really get my students, you know, they really want to get their drawings, their proportions right. And sometimes much of our, the bulk of our time is spent on, you know, um, accurate drawing and color mixing. So I like to teach abstract and non-objective art because it gives us, it's almost like a sandbox, you know, like an isolated place to work with the elements and principles of art, things like, um, things like, emphasis and variety and harmony um, without having to, to quote unquote worry about um, drawing accurately. But then for my own artwork and for artwork that I, that I want to hang up and look at, um, you know, just for myself, I prefer artwork that's more representational or just stylized, which is sort of the first stage in abstraction. That being said, in the world of, uh, of design and illustration, um, I think there is a I think it's important for artists to be able to work abstractly because sometimes how they change their subject is a way of saying, um, you know, communicating something about that subject. I know that's a long answer. Well, I think it's a good answer. Um, I also kind of agree with everything you said. I love teaching abstraction mm -hmm. <laughs> and even non-objective art for the same reasons. It gives you a chance to talk about composition and the importance of the elements and principles of art, just like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people think that abstract and uh, non-objective art is easy to create until they, until they try to make it. <laughs> it try to make it and make it something that people really want to look at, something compelling, you know? Right. And then they realize, hey, wait a minute, this is kind of hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's because... Uh, you really need to know how the elements and principles work together to create an aesthetically successful composition since abstraction is so uh, so reliant on composition. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to add a little bit of yellow ochre to some areas here real quick, and um, then I'm going to go back and add a little bit more shadow to some of these white areas. So, you know, we've got these white areas, these open areas, and, you know, they're white, and I put that in quotations, but I feel like we need a little bit of color in there too. So just to make it feel a little bit more natural, so I'm going to put down a little bit of yellow ochre here. Oh, now um, Richard's asking a question that I think was asked. And Richard, I think you might have asked this last week, and I don't know if I answered. I, don't, I know I didn't answer it, but I believe I read it last week. Would either of you guys consider doing a getting sketchy in China marker? And um, I, I would consider that, Richard. I've actually thought about it before, and not a lot of people use China markers. And so I wondered, did anybody even know what China markers are if I broke those out? Some people call them grease pencils. Um, I, think, I think grease pencil and China marker, I think those are synonymous terms. I'm not sure. But I like them. I like the way they feel, you know, the way they sort of slide across a surface. So it's definitely a possibility. I haven't worked with a with a China marker in years, but I do have a box of them. Yeah. And I actually thought about, um, you know, see what medium was I going to use here? I just, my mind just went completely <laughs> blank. Um, a carbon pencil. My goodness. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I considered using a carbon pencil this week instead mm -hmm. of this, uh, this ridiculous combination of media <laughs> here in this it's going short really period well. of time. Yeah, it's okay. I, the colors are not quite as, uh, they're not going to be as complex as I'd like them to be just because I don't have time to build up the complexity in the color. Yeah. And uh, the way to build up the complexity in the color is through layering. Um, but I'm going to try to push as far as I can. There is some blue up here in the, I think this is a reflection of the sky off the head here. I'm going to try to get a little bit more blue in there. Probably what that is. Well, I like the variety of color you have, and I, I like how more more colorful you made those what you know those white spots on the front. Yeah, they just I, don't you know they don't translate very well as just being white. Yeah, I like them. I think, and I can see the variability in the value now that you've accentuated that in your drawing. Okay, thanks. 
just Let's at see. this point, I'm not really looking at the reference anymore. I'm I'm trying to look at opportunities to make this more of a successful painting mm -hmm. and a little bit more of a neutral gray here to some areas. A lot of uh, requests right now are some requests about uh, materials. There's a, let's see, who was, it may have been Maria that asked, would you ever use ink and oil paint? I assume you mean not together, ink or oil paint maybe, or otherwise that's a process I'm not familiar with. But um, Matt, have you, you've used some other, you've done other ink drawings and I did an ink drawing last season, or, you know, just with a regular disposable pen, not a dip pen. It wasn't an ink wash. Um, or an ink painting. Um, I've thought about I've thought about trying to use oil paint on getting sketchy because I do like to sketch in oil paint. You know, I can go pretty fast in oil paint because um, it's a medium that I'm highly familiar with. But I don't know if anybody would follow along if I painted an oil paint for 45 minutes. I mean, you can almost just mix your colors for 45 minutes before you even start. I'm a little nervous about that one. Yeah, I wonder if she's talking about, is she talking about getting sketchy or is she talking about a specific mm. combination of media? I know That's my time's up. That's what I'm not up. certain on. That's what I'm not certain about. Maria, if you're talking about a combo, an ink and paint combo, just let us know. I know my time is up, but I'm going to go ahead and enhance some of these super dark areas. Sure. And drop in a shadow there um, once I get these in place here. Well, it's a good likeness of your subject especially in, uh, in color and in 45 minutes. Well, thanks. Hopefully, whoever this ladybug is would be recognized by their ladybug friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joan McDonald asks, how can you get black to look shiny when you use ink? Well, it's really, it's all in the values, Joan, and it's going to be a value contrast. You know, a shininess... Um, is, is saying that there's a reflection, and usually it's a reflection of light, just like what we see on the top of that ladybug's uh, thorax. That's right, how there's some sort of muted lighter value there, and Matt mentioned it's probably the sky. That I would say that's true. Now, if, that, um, if, you, if you look at, this is interesting, if you look at the abdomen, which is, I think I'm getting this right, the red part, one of the reflections on that part has a sharper edge to its highlight. And so that tells me it's a smoother, shinier surface than the thorax, which has sort of a softer, blurry edge around the highlight. So how sharp or soft your highlight is really communicates to the viewer whether they're looking at something like shiny plastic or something more like a ball bearing, you know, something that's like chrome. But it's going to be through value contrast. So don't be afraid to have really light areas. Now, of course, you're talking about black ink. Um, so... You know, I'm assuming you're talking about drawing, not painting, like with a wash, which is what Matt's doing. So um, you have to work, I guess you probably would have to work uh, large enough that your marks can be spaced out in those lighter areas to capture the, you know, the, the light gray that you may be looking for. And, um, you know, what Ashley alluded to this or, or said it outright, um, the key to creating any texture is uh, through the relationships of the values. Including shiny. Yeah, and shiny shiny surfaces typically have high contrast between dark and light. Usually they're right next to each other. If the value is, is almost white and not quite, and you're using pen and ink, um, just make it white. You know, if it's a very, very light, light gray, just you may just have to make it white. Unless you're stippling, then you've got a little more, there's a little more uh, flexibility. Okay, let's add a shadow under here for this. I'm just going to use ultramarine. Shia says, uh, Ashley, Bob Ross painted in 27 minutes, so 45 minutes is very doable. Well, now, we know that Bob Ross had some, 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 uh, some camera tricks. Or he had some effects there. And, uh, and he also, um, he practiced. He painted all of his pictures more than once. And, and also, I would say this about Bob Ross paintings. You are seeing Bob Ross paintings from a very far distance away. <laughs> That's true. And um, 
if you saw one of his paintings up close, you would probably be shocked at the lack of, of, of detail. Um, and yeah. He used what's called um, invented texture invented texture where he used like brush marks you know and special types of brushes like a fan brush to create the impression of a texture um, instead of sort of painstakingly um, simulating or trying to reproduce that texture as a copy and we're neither we're, matt nor i are complaining about bob ross we're just explaining no, no, no. his we, process his style and how it worked for a 27 minute right program. we we both we both love bob ross right. don't don't get us wrong uh, but um I think with time lapse videos that you see on YouTube, along with making assumptions about how Bob Ross worked and stuff, that has made people think that they too can create drawings and paintings in a very short period of time and have the same results. And I think that that is that's misleading, um, especially like I said with like YouTube videos and time lapse and that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, we we tend to think that paintings and drawings take a lot less time than they actually do. When in reality, they they don't. They they do take time. <laughs> Sometimes mm -hmm. lots and lots of time. All um, right, I'm going to call this one finished. Um, all right, with that uh, cool shadow sets the bug off from the white surface. So that was a good good choice oh. instead of using that green blade, that green. Background. Yeah, that 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 that. Now that's an example of something that you know somebody asked earlier. That green blade might not have translated very well in this particular image uh, because um, of the medium and because we're zoomed in so close, mm -hmm. you know, in the reference. That would be, you know, if we were using colored pencils or something like that, we'd have a little bit more control over the medium and we'd probably pull off a convincing uh, replication. But in this particular case, uh, it's probably better on the white background. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have any other... Oh, uh, just some just some Bob Ross comments in there. Um, Bob Ross was epic. I think his style was loose and free. I watched Bob in real time on PBS a century ago. Well, it was last century, but not a century ago. Very funny. And uh, Norlene, I think uh, earlier mentioned that the reason he was able to. I think the reason he was able to paint like that is because he was magic. He was magic white. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, Bob Ross. I, I, I think I'm correct in saying this is he was not originally an artist. I think he was maybe in the Marines. I may be wrong about that. Um, like a, like a career soldier. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't oh, think he was a, uh, he, I don't think he was a trained artist. Interesting. Um, I'll have to do the uh, research, but also I, it's my understanding that Bob Ross created three paintings of everything that he did. He did one for practice, one for the show, and then one for, step-by-step -step book material that was later That's published. That's right. His books are actually really valuable. You know, yeah. there's a lot of writing in there between the uh, between the images. I did my first oil painting from one of Bob Ross's books when I was 12. So. All right. All right great um, job, Matt. Looks wonderful. All right. Well, I just want to just say a couple things about this real quick. First of all, if this was a more finished, complete painting, I, I'm, I don't know how much I would go back into this area because I did put the washes on pretty quickly uh, or pretty heavily. But I kind of like to approach watercolor painting with a layered approach. I gradually build up the value so that they're darker and that the colors are more intense. And I was able to do that to a certain degree down here at the bottom. But the, this area needs more complexity other than just some purples and blues and yellow ochre and things. Uh, this is starting to get there, but uh, still, we could still make that a lot stronger and more vibrant. Um, but I also want to point out that when you're combining pen and ink and watercolor, you need to make sure that one medium doesn't necessarily overpower the other one. So you need to find a balance between the two. This could mean that you have more intense watercolor applications and less intense pen and ink applications, or you could have more intense pen and ink applications and less watercolor applications. In this particular case, we kind of got a balance going on between equal parts watercolor and pen and ink. But just think about that. Uh, no matter how you approach a pen and ink and watercolor image, whether you put the watercolor on first or the pen and ink on first. All right, so let's go ahead and switch back out. Well, thanks for sticking around for uh, the last hour plus. Um, we're going to be heading over to uh, the virtual instructor. 
after this, I'm gonna be doing some colored pencil drawing. So I'm gonna be shifting gears to a certain degree here, slowing down a bit and continuing work on that peony flower here. We're almost done, we're almost completed. Um, thanks again for joining us tonight, guys. Do uh, you have anything else to add? I don't have anything to add, uh, just appreciate all of your comments. I learned a lot about ladybugs tonight, a lot about <laughs> flowers, and a little bit about bats. So we'll do it all again uh, next week, same time, same channel. What's that song way down yonder in the Chattahoochee? That's right, by Alan Jackson. Yeah, yeah. It, it sounded a little bit like what you said you learned a little bit about. <laughs> don't, right. don't they say something like You're that in that song? You're not going to sing. I'm not going to sing. But, but do you know the words? I do. do, you... I do. Unfortunately, I think I, I think, think your I mic has like turned. It, somehow it's still picking you up. There we go. Pointed <laughs> a completely different direction. Bumped it with my head. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, one last reminder. If you want to check out our membership program, there's a link in the description below. It includes all of our courses. They're all included. You don't have to buy them extra. Um, somebody asked me about that today. Uh, oh, they're all included. Uh, if you want to check out three of our course videos and eBooks for free, there's a link in the description below. And subscribe to the channel. It's absolutely free to do so. We do fun stuff like this all the time. <laughs> Thanks again for watching. You guys have a safe and wonderful week. We'll do this again right here next week at the same time. And I hope to see you then. With that, I'm going to go ahead and sign out for a little while anyway. Good night, everybody.